Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to another edition of the Lambom Show. Today is uh, Wednesday, August 31st, 2022. It's the last day of the month of August, and we started off this month uh, reviewing the new strategy paper that was released by the Biden administration with respect to its policy or strategy towards uh, sub-Saharan Africa. For the last uh, three weeks, we have been having different experts look at uh, the strategy. There has been a very, very positive response to it. Tonight, I'm not sure how positive we're going to be because uh, we are privileged and happy to have with us uh, Dr. Lawrence Freeman. Welcome, Dr. Lawrence. Great to be with you. Thank you very much. You mind telling our audience a little bit about yourself so that they know the kind of person they are dealing with? Well, I've been uh, involved in Africa for um, over 30 years. I started getting involved in the late uh, 1980s, and then increasingly I became more involved. And over the last 10 years, it's been my passion uh, and I created a website, LawrenceFreemanAfricanTheWorld.com, about five years ago, so I could get out my point of view. And I teach classes in the Maryland area on African history. I'm a consultant, a researcher, a public speaker on Africa. And um, I've been uh, keep working with various individuals and in various uh, countries on primarily African development, but overall more political economy and intelligence. And I've probably been to the continent a couple dozen times or more. I've lost track and visited a, a number of sub-Saharan African nations. I participated in Nigeria uh, with President uh, Mamadou Buhari on a project I have called Transaqua to bring water to the shrinking lake Chad. Uh, I've been involved in Sudan, Mali, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, recently very much in Ethiopia, and um, I hope I'm having a positive influence for a development policy for Africa, which I consider the most important single policy we should have. Thank you very much. That's a breadth and a wealth of experience there, but I want to start off by asking, why did you, be, why did you choose Africa? Why, why did you become so interested in Africa? Well, that, um, I'll try to make the story short. Uh, I'm going on 72. Uh, when I was in high school and college, those were the late 1960s, where issues of social conscience and morality and politics was very prevalent. And I threw myself into it as a young teenager. And uh, at that time, the issue of Africa was only peripheral. I was involved very heavily in American left politics at the time. And, but I wondered why a continent so rich in potential had starvation. That was my number one question. I couldn't figure it out. And I didn't really return to that subject until the 1980s. And I began to look at it again. I attracted around me some Cameroonians, spoke with them at their conference. Uh, some Nigerians reached out to me. Uh, that led to me also making some trips to Sudan, where I brought state, African American state legislators to investigate the charges against Sudan by the US government. And it just kept growing and growing. And now it's uh, my full-time occupation. So it started out as a question, a concern, and it developed into a full-fledged uh, driven passion. So I, I'm wondering why you decided to start a website. Uh, was it out of frustration with uh, the administrations, maybe the politicians not accepting your point of view? Why did you find it necessary to start a website in order to push out your uh, opinions about Africa? Well, as I say, I, uh, my first visit was to Lagos, Nigeria in 1994. And I have gone a couple of visits, a couple dozen times since then. And I became more and more concerned. I was speaking out, I was writing, I was attracting people around me. And I thought that having my own voice which would not be restricted or censored or controlled by anyone was the most important thing I could do. I believe that we can eliminate hunger and poverty in Africa if we have the right economic policies. I'm a student of and an advocate of Alexander Hamilton's policies which built the United States. 
And I'm totally convinced that we can build industrial economies in Africa with robust manufacturing agricultural sectors and with all the potential of people and fertile land, uh, water, with the right ingredients, which is primarily infrastructure. Africa is dying, literally, not figuratively, dying from lack of electricity, dying from a lack of, uh, of infrastructure, dying from uh, railroads. And um, I want to turn this around, and hopefully before I pass on, I'm going to live as long as I can to accomplish my task of creating an industrialized African continent. Have you thought of getting into maybe public policy in terms of getting into one of the think tanks in D.C. or getting into the government in order to influence U.S. policy? And what has that experience been? I've tried. I've tried the... Some of the think tanks, some of the people respect my ideas, but they're not going to uh, support them. And uh, the government has generally been, uh, for the last 20 or more years, the U.S. government has been wrong in its policy. I have some African friends and African Americans who have tried to help me reach out to the Biden administration. I actually spoke at a peripheral conference on the day of inauguration that was organized by African women. Uh, but basically, people do not either agree as a matter of policy. The United States does not agree on the concept of development, or people think I'm um, uh, too demanding, maybe too radical, uh, and they won't reach out to support ideas. The think tanks are very comfortable. There's a lot of the same people. They push the same ideas. I would say there's an element of uh, groupthink, and uh, I've always demanded not to accept groupthink, not to accept what's popular, uh, to go outside of what everybody thinks. And people have uh, reached out to me. Uh, for example, in 2010, uh, General William uh, Kipp, um, uh, the first commander of AFRICOM, uh, he reached out to me and asked me to participate in a uh, retreat, a private retreat of about a dozen people in Germany to hear my ideas. Other people have reached out to me. Many African leaders have, African presidents, and even uh, people in Washington. And so I have a group of people who uh, respect my ideas, support my ideas, but we don't yet have enough strength to implement my ideas. So again, before we dive into what we are actually supposed to be discussing, I'm wondering what are these ideas that are so, that is keeping the whole place uh, on their feet, or on their toes to be on edge with you? Because, uh, I mean, I have one article that I've just read, your, the article you wrote, but I don't see how too, too much of, uh, uh, call it an outsider, that is. So what well, is... Well, you what you have is you have a, an establishment in the West you have it, and it's in Washington, where most people grope around the same policy. And you have a group of people in this administration and have been in previous administrations who don't really, are not fully committed to developing African nations. So the African nations are sovereign, independent, and economically viable nations. They don't believe in that concept. That was the, we saw that in the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, Obama administration, Trump administration, Biden administration. You see that in the think tanks. I want to speak out and say what's true. We've watched and witnessed policies of genocide in Africa. They've not been appropriately responded to. Uh, like, for example, a concrete example, take the situation in Ethiopia. The U.S. government has uh, the Biden administration and Secretary of State Blinken had a policy to undermine the democratic elected government of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed when the war started with uh, Tigray uh, in November 2020. And they're maintaining it today. So they don't want to hear what I have to say. And the think tanks in Washington don't want to hear what I have to say. And they don't want to hear what I have to say about their so-called view of democracy. I've had situations where when people see me, they come up to me, they want to talk. Other people walk to the other side of the street because uh, 
they know what I stand for. Now, there's a lot of passive support I get from ambassadors and residents of these African nations. Uh, but in very few cases, only a few, have they willing to go full-fledged in, in implementing my ideas. For example, I've been working with others, but I picked it up as a primary campaign, this Transaqua project, which was developed in 1980 by an Italian engineering firm called Bonifica. And they had this brilliant idea, this guy Marcello Vicchi, to take a portion of the water of the Congo River, maybe 5%, 8%, build a series of small dams on the right side of the Congo River, and you would build a canal, a navigable canal that would feed water into the Central African Republic, into Lake, uh, into the Chari River, which releases its water into Lake Chad. Lake Chad is dying. And this plan would refurbish Lake Chad, potentially, to the level it had 1963 of 25,000 square kilometers. So there was an individual who was running the Lake Chad Basin Commission. I went to hear him speak in Washington. I intervened with my ideas. We met afterwards and we formed uh, an informal alliance for several years. And I was put on the Lake Chad Basin Advisory Committee, the Scientific Advisory Committee in 2014. And we pushed these ideas all the way to 2018 where the water minister of the Bahari government and Bahari himself, President Bahari, who I knew for a while, they called a conference in February of 2018. I was one of the primary speakers, and we endorsed this plan. But Africa being Africa and people opposed to it, the French and others, it has not been implemented. So there was a situation where there was a great deal of support, and the program still did not succeed so far. I haven't given up on it. I was in Nigeria last uh, yeah, a year ago, April, uh, but uh, I'm beginning to think that it's not going to happen, but it's still potential. So again, what I mean, what is it in the program that is causing um, the call it the Africans to be opposed to it? Because I think water is a primary commodity that's needed everywhere, and the Chad Basic Commission, I think that's what they should be. What is the problem with that particular program? Well, on the one hand, you have the French who are completely opposed to it. And they've written articles in French attacking me and attacking the program. They don't want to see that area of the world develop, and they don't want to lose control of the Congo and other places. Then you have various people who don't want to go with such a large program, which is foolish. The program uh, may cost $80 billion, possibly. Maybe, uh, no, I would say $50 billion. At the conference in Abuja, it was called the Lake Save Lake Chad Basin Conference, the Save Lake Chad Conference. We asked fifty billion dollars from the uh, African Union. You need a feasibility study, which would take a year and a half, and then you need to implement. You have to see if you can build these dams, what the level of water is. You need a team of twenty-five engineers, scientists, hydrologists. I, when I met with President Bahari personally on this more than once, but one of the means, that, and I said, this is a great legacy for you, but it would transform Nigeria because you'd have an economic super zone between the dry, arid countries of the Lake Chad Basin and the wet countries of the Congo and the, and the Great Lakes, and Nigeria would be right in the middle, and um, this would be a fantastic program for development. And people said, no, it's too big an idea, it's too expensive, we have to think small. And then you have all of these NGOs who surround the place with their, let's keep things the way they are, let's keep them pristine. Do we really think the people in Lake Chad Basin, 30 million people living in poverty, by the way, do, do we really want to impose on them our Western values like clean water, economic development, prosperity. I spoke at a conference in the UN that was sponsored by uh, the Nigerian embassy. And people said to me, well, how do you know they want this? And I said, because they're human beings. What you got up this morning, you broke up in a hotel, you shaved with hot water, you took a bath, you took transportation to get to this conference. 
You don't think Africans want the same thing for themselves and their children? So there's a very big lobby that's an anti-development lobby in the West. And they say these development projects are too big, too expensive. And I said, this is the only way to deal with the insecurity of late shot. If people have jobs, you cut down on the recruitment to Boko Haram. Boko Haram recruits because there's poverty and they offer a kid, has nothing to do with Islam. $200 a day is what it has to do with. Now, if you build up the area and you show a future and prosperity for the parents and the children, then you can eliminate some of the problems. No, we, we have to make sure nothing is really changed and we could deal with it in small ways. And I think big, and I think big, thinking big is the only way to solve problems of Africa. I want to see high-speed railroad across Africa, which is being pushed by several people. It's even in the AU program. It's just they're taking too long. But there's a Nigerian friend of mine who says we can do it in 13 years. Uh, that would be a huge investment, but it would transform Africa. An east-west railroad connecting Banki, which is the city, the capital of one of the poorest countries, Central African Republic, would become a major transport center. All these things are possible, but there's a whole group of thinking out there that doesn't want to think this way, challenge authorities and think big. And then the other problem is the, what I call the geopolitical oligarchy, the financial political elites who are opposed to development. And they, they don't want my policies to be implemented at all because it would challenge their control of the situation. And that's, for example, why I went to Ethiopia against the orders of my State Department. We said the Americans should not go in December of last year. And I, I spoke every single day on several media calling out the State Department for saying that people in Ethiopia were f fleeing the country wanted to leave, offering free tickets because the TPLF was going to invade the city momentarily. They even, the State Department, in a rather disgusting manner, even referred to the situation as Afghanistan. We're not going to allow an Afghanistan to develop. And of course, I went around the city as I know it, took pictures, put them out, and as a result, uh, I became some of a folk hero in Ethiopia because I was challenging uh, Secretary Blinken and President Biden, who were tacitly supporting the TPLF by undermining the Abiy government. So I, I get myself in a lot of trouble. I don't know any other way to function but to say what's on my mind and what I know. And I know more than 99.9% .9 of Americans about Africa. And I have a great number of, uh, uh, I would call them revolutionary ideas for how to transform Africa. And no one's going to Unless they convince me otherwise by the power of reason, I'm not going to be stopped. Yeah, but again, I mean, one one pushback I have is when you have big ideas and you want to start with the big ideas, um, I mean, it's um, self-defeating, isn't it, in a sense? Because again, having realized that it's big, you don't have the money to do that. If you were a billionaire, you could push that through. But you could also start small, isn't it? There are, there are big chunks that you could do, but you could also start from those little things and build up to the big policy. So why do you insist on going big rather than small up to the big? Well, first of all, it's not a money problem because why I call myself a Hamiltonian, and this was used by Abraham Lincoln. This was policy of uh, Henry Carey, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. State credit is the way to build infrastructure, not the private. The private side, they can't afford to build it. You need long-term, 15-year loans, 2 to 3% interest to build infrastructure, energy. Africa has 100,000 megawatts or less in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. I want to I wanna have 1,600 gigawatts, not 100,000 megawatts. You need government credit. These things cannot be done small. They, and the problem is that people occupy themselves with saying, well, we can do something good here. We can do a little bit of good here. We can do a little bit of good here, but we won't transform. And as a result, hundreds of millions and possibly billions of people will suffer or die.
because people refuse to think big. And thinking small is uh, very dangerous in, in my view. So I try to actually organize myself mentally not to think small, just like I organize myself to distance myself from the current Western culture, which I find uh, very corrosive to my thinking. So I take actions mentally that keep me in the state of mind where I can make the unique contributions that I know will work. I'm convinced. And I've convinced several people, but uh, I haven't convinced enough people, but they will work, the big programs. And they have done in the past. I mean, I don't know, uh, in America, I mean, how do we get to where we are? Look at Roosevelt's policies in the 30s. They transformed the United States and the world. He created the reconstruct. he used the reconstruction finance company and it, it issued 30, 40 billion dollars in credit and didn't lose a penny. We could do the same thing. I'm working on a program with some friends of mine to build an Africa infrastructure, infrastructure development bank. And uh, I can write the proposal if I had the time and the support, and then we would have to find governments to support it. That's a great, uh, I love the proposal about the Africa Infrastructure Bank. It's a great one because Africa needs it. But I'm just worried as to, you already laid, you know where the booby traps are. I don't know how you avoid those booby traps. But let's, let's maybe a good way to get into the new strategy. Um, you published an article on your, on your site uh, two days ago. It says, Blinken implores for West's rules-based order, South African Rwanda pushback. And I think in a nutshell, I mean, the one thing that I picked out from it, which was quite striking, is your statement that the U.S. strategy is not addressing Africa's interests. How is that so? Well, and this is what we've been generally discussing. You've got at least 1.5 billion people. And I've already mentioned the fact you have probably under 100,000 megawatts of power for sub-Saharan Africa, which is where the majority of the population is, except for Egypt. You have almost no density of railroads in Africa. I must say one of the great pleasures of my life was in April last year when I went to Africa and I visited an old friend of mine in Kaduna and I was able to take a train. <laughs> That's the first train I've ever taken in Africa. But there should be trains everywhere. So Africa right now is suffering from the biggest infrastructure deficit of any continent. And I've done studies on Ethiopia, Democratic Republic Congo, Central African Republic, for individuals on these. So I know this inside now. So the question is, if the United States wants to help Africans and African nations, then they have to launch a gigantic development policy, uh, like uh, the World War II mobilization on the Roosevelt. And the proof that they're not interested in this is the fact that they, rather than look at what China is doing that's positive, and they could coordinate with China on the Belt and Road because the infrastructure deficit is so massive in Africa. They choose not only not to do it, but they choose to attack China. And at every point where they could make an input into actual development, the reason I call myself a Hamiltonian is Hamilton built the United States. I mean, you know, it comes across a little bit in the play but he really was a towering economic genius, and George Washington understood that. He created a national bank. That national bank funded the development of this country and took 13 debt-ridden colonies and made us into the greatest country at one time on the, on the planet. That can be done anywhere, but you have to have a commitment to do it. The United States says no. They'll, I've questioned them. I've questioned officials publicly in forums in Washington before COVID. And they say, quote, and I'm quoting, we don't do infrastructure. Now, if you don't do infrastructure, then really you don't give a damn about Africa because that's what Africa needs. And you can see in the African strategy, it's really not there. I mean, they point to a program 
that has a potential worldwide of trying to get funds, but it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. The way it's going to happen is either African nations collectively take action, which is possible, with allies, and China is an ally in this area, or you do what the uh, Ethiopians did, which is you fund the dam, the Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, they funded it themselves, $5 billion from bonds and contributions from Ethiopians. So no one has control of that dam but the Ethiopians. And that I love that com commitment. We could do that in limited ways, but if you want to tr you want to transform the continent, then you need a lending institution. That's why I would write this bank, like Hamilton's bank, Infrastructure Development Bank, that would lend money for specific projects at interest rates that would be low enough not to be usurious. Now, the United States could make a capital contribution to that project. They would never think of that. That's what some Africans in the United States asked me to propose to Biden, which I did to a group of people. China's doing some good things. They're not perfect, but they're doing some good things. Why say no? We're going to oppose the Belt and Road and then try to counter with some feeble operation instead of making a joint commitment with China, the China and United States, two most powerful countries economically, and say we together have a shared common interest to help the African nations develop. And then I believe we could end hunger and poverty in 20 years with that kind of commitment. So if you are just joining us, you're on the Lambom Show, and I'm on set with uh, Dr. Lawrence Freeman. And that's very interesting to hear. You would prioritize infrastructure over um, the current poverty alleviation measures that are being taken. Yes. Just one question for you directly. What I mean, if you are looking for a bank, what is the role of the African Development Bank? Because they have infrastructural projects that they're currently running. They do. They're, the problem is, well, first of all, uh, they're very small. I mean, if you have looked at their website, they, I mean, a big project for them is $100 million. I'm talking about projects of $100 billion, if you look at the scope of them. They don't have the capital base. They could. Then they'd have to rewrite their program and they'd have to change the orientation and they'd have to have a, a new capital infusion. And already, I think 40% of their money comes from outside the African states, 40% of the um, African Union. So I don't think they're going to do that. And um, therefore, I would propose a infrastructure bank. Uh, we would set the ground rules for the capital base. Well, you know, let's say we start with uh, $5 billion, but that's really not very much. We probably want to start with much more than that. Probably want to start with $100 billion or more. dollars. There are programs in the United States to create a new uh, Hamiltonian bank that would start with $5 trillion. And then you decide what portion of that money can be lent out for what projects, which countries would have to back it up with a portion of their own money as the project entered their own country. And uh, it's, a, it's a process that can work. As I say, Hamilton did it. The problem is you, you'd have to have a, they probably need support from outside of Africa because African countries, the currencies are not even tradable, <laughs> convertible internationally. So if, you know, if you Biden, uh, and I have my questions about his, uh, his overall policies, but if you wanted to do something that would be a great legacy for himself in the United States and Africa, then he would contribute a large capital amount of money into such a bank to serve as the capital base to be lent out. I understand why there's aid programs. I'm not, I've, I've been to the force several times. I've been to refugee camps. I'm, I'm appalled. I, uh, conditions there are horrible. So aid has to be done. But the problem with aid like the problem with military support is it goes, it doesn't develop anything. It just, it's out. It's not to say it isn't necessary, but it doesn't, nothing comes back from it. If you make an investment in infrastructure for, you know, if we start building uh, small 
nuclear reactors, which is very possible across Africa, then you would see a transformation, not only in, in electrical power, but of the entire economy because you'd be raising it up to a nuclear level, much less going to fusion. And this is not original to me. If you uh, get a chance to read uh, Chikanta Diop's books on a federated Africa, he talks about nuclear energy in 1960 and nobody was listening to him. And what the potential is to train, have a cadre of African engineers and scientists in this industry. Now, South Africa is the only country that has two nuclear power plants that were built by the Afrikaners. Although at one point they did have a, 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 a program to build a pebble bed a nuclear reactor and export it. It since um, went out of business, but it's a very feasible project. And I think it's a lot more potential in wind or solar and even hydro, which is subject to weather conditions. But these are the kind of things. Now, there are 17 African countries in one stage or another working on nuclear energy. And Egypt is now in a construction program with Russia to build four nuclear reactors in Egypt, which I commend them for. South Africa has two in its negotiations to build more. Uh, Kenya has some negotiation process. Uh, Nigeria is involved somewhat. Uh, Ghana. So people have various stages. But these are the kinds of programs we need. Now, will the United States support that? I don't know. The United States doesn't really support projects. I mean, you know, Obama's announced Power Africa, but it's basically an off-grid solar project. And that's not going to transform the industry of Africa. Again, there's the same same question with respect to you have the off grid approach, but you have to start small because you live in a country where to appropriate those funds, you have to go through Congress and based on the political uh, divisions here, it becomes difficult, isn't it? I'm sure there are many Hamiltonians like you who believe in these kind of projects, but they just do not believe in the kind of multilateralism where you can, you know, Put in money in Africa. They have seen it over the years. Uh, I love the fact you talked about aid. It's not bringing back anything. At least it's going to bring some fish to the people. But how to get the people again to start fishing for themselves is a problem. And I just think even your point you made about the infrastructure thing, I find that fascinating because I've always thought that uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation is one of those entities by the United States that is also focused on infrastructure. I don't know how much they have done for Africa. They have tied it to some the, some conditions, economic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, I, I think there are there are pockets of initiatives around that the U.S. is engaged in, but I think you are asking for a groundswell. And my my whole thing is, half a loaf is better than none. So why not even support the half a loaf? I mean, this is in respect to the policy itself that we the strategy we are talking about, and then build that up. Well, I'm not. I don't. I don't spend my time opposing small projects. I spend my time opposing wrong policies and advocating the right policy. You could build uh, solar in parts of Africa and you might be able to light your light bulbs in your house and your cell phone, but you're not gonna be able to build an industry. In fact, I mean, they cannot, solar energy cannot even run a freezer or an air conditioner. And uh, if you've been to Nigeria or familiar with Nigeria, I'm very familiar there, even in upscale neighborhoods, uh, you cannot get enough power to run your air conditioner. So you have your own generator, then you have batteries, these huge batteries, and we're not talking about everybody here, big batteries to absorb the energy, but only on grid electricity can run refrigerators, freezers, and electricity, and industrialized machinery. So I'm not going to advocate something that's not going to do what I want. If it's not going to transform and make African nations industrial, uh, developed, industrially developed, then I don't see the point of me spending the small amount of time I have left on this planet advocating those policies. I've got to advocate the policies that are transformative, that no one else wants to think about. 
That's a great point. I don't know, again, with respect to how much time you have left in, on the planet, but I'm just worried about, again, let the, the small things, let the perfect not become the enemy of the good, isn't it? That, that's uh, something that we, uh, we say all the time. But the other thing I wanted to find out, in your essay, you, you said um, there's little substance in this strategy, little substance. And that's a 17 page document yeah and there's a page there that also talks about the, the an evaluation of 30 years of u.s africa policy that's a bold statement to come out to say that there's little substance let's start with a little substance that little you new. little new <laughs> okay <laughs> little new substance okay let us let us talk about the little part that you 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 loved about it and then get into and i know you have already mentioned one the infrastructure thing is a big piece for you, but what was a small piece you found in, you found interesting in the strategy? I didn't really find anything that was that interesting. I mean, if you look at the whole document, and you and you and also look at the document as it was developed and came out at the same time that Secretary Blinken was in uh, making his three nation tour, beginning in South Africa, then the Democratic Republic of Congo, and then Rwanda. I think you have to look at that together somewhat because what the United States says in the document and they name it in the executive summary, they name it in the first point on open society, they attack Russia and China head on. Yet Blinken in his various remarks, says, oh, no, no, we're moving away from that. We've got something better to offer the United States. We're not here to manipulate African nations and insist they join with us. Well, that's exactly what they're trying to do because their game plan, and, and Blinken is a good example of this, uh, Secretary of State Blinken, he's been around forever. He was part of the Obama administration. He was one of Hillary Clinton's people. Biden picked him up. Biden was part of the Obama administration. Biden's been around forever. These establishment figures, they think they're indoctrinated with a disease called geopolitics. Geopolitics is a disease thinking. People should be hospitalized for it because it says that the world is fixed. People are fixed. Nations are fixed. The world is fixed. And the only question is who remains on top in a zero sum game? Now, I don't believe, I believe individuals, the most powerful ele element of a human individual is their creativity. Only the human species, unlike any other species, has the power of creative thought creative imagination, discovery. Plato called it hypothesis. No other creature has that. So that's what makes us human. And nation states are there to help nurture and develop that creative power of every single human being, every child born. So nothing is fixed. Everything is changing. Everything is developing. And the potential of this universe is unlimited, as we're seeing a little bit from the new telescope. So the, these guys, these geopolitical doctrinaires, say no. We have to remain on top. China and Russia have to remain below us. Where do you stand in this process? And this is their worldview. They don't understand human beings. They don't understand us. They don't understand nation states. They don't understand what real diplomacy is. We go back to Franklin Roosevelt. He worked with his enemies to accomplish goals. He sat down with Joe Stalin and Chiang Kai-shek and others. He did what was necessary to uplift the world. They don't want to uplift the world. They want to control. So they go out on their program and say, democracy, you must follow our rules-based order. Whose rules-based order? Who made the rules? Our rules-based order and our notion of democracy. You will have elections. You will do this. You will do that. You will do this. And that's our contribution to your country. Forget about China and their stealing your resources, so-called. You should work with us, and we're going to give you these great, wonderful values of democracy, 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 and human rights. And it offers nothing. And I made the case, and I put a picture in my, in my article, to a mother trying to feed her children. How, in, how dare you discuss your noble ideas of democracy? You're not even giving that parent the opportunity to think. They can't think that day because their day is consumed with how to find food to feed their children. 
Democracy has nothing to do with what they're talking about. Democracy has to do with ideas of people in debate and discussion. Where should our country go? What's the best policy? Should we, what does this guy represent? What does that guy represent? Well, you know, I got my own ideas. And you have a discussion of ideas because human beings are nothing but ideas outside of biological housing. That is only going to take place when people have leisure time. That's only going to take place when people have food, when they have electricity, when they have a library shelf that the children can go to and study and read the great thinkers of the world. That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about their process, their control, what they want to happen. I, again, I go back to Ethiopia. President, uh, Prime Minister Abiy was actually elected in two elections, one in June, which was imperfect, but the AU was there, I was there, and the AU had 65 observers, and I, I talked to Obasanjo publicly about it, and they said it was a legitimate election. The United States never supported it. And there was a second election in September for the regions that couldn't do it. So democratically, the Prosperity Party and Prime Minister Abiy were elected. The United States has never recognized it. Is that democracy? Where's democracy? It's a fraud. So the United States says, we're going to teach you democracy, and that is much more valuable than what you're getting from these other superpowers. And if you don't go with us, there are veiled threats. And I tell you, you should go back and look at the clips of the, Linda Thomas Greenfield, the ambassador of the UN, when the African countries did not in, march in step with the United States in sanctioning Russia. Twice they didn't do it. And Greenfield did tell them, Blinken didn't say this, but she did, you're on the wrong side. And that's what uh, the minister, Natalie Pandora, said to Blinken. She said, you haven't said it, but other people have said it. You're telling us always what to do. Well, we don't want to be told what to do. Why can't we be treated like sovereign states? Why do we have a bill in the U.S. Congress only geared towards Africa if they support Russia? Why, why does that bill exist? No other continent in the world has a bill written that they, they, are, they will be reprimanded and punished and sanctioned if they support Africa. It hasn't passed, but it's a bill nevertheless. That's not democracy to me. Democracy is a discussion of ideas about a future that doesn't yet exist, that we're going to bring into existence, but we can see the future in our mind's eye and then we're gonna to march to accomplish it. Who's gonna come up with those ideas? The United so, States. <laughs> again, United States. <laughs> again, that's an interesting way of reading the situation because I think to characterize democracy as just um, ideas, there is a, you, you have, I mean, I'm sure you've read uh, Hobbes and all these other guys who talk about the, at least in the natural order, there needs to be some agreement as to how things are supposed to exist, isn't it? Then we will take that based on those agreements, we will now see how to improve on society. You know, I think the problem we have with the democracy that is, is practiced in Africa is, and I want to look at the example of um, the countries that China, because they, it's a hands, hands off approach. Do your thing, we don't want to be engaged in all that. And then they, they come in on their Belt and Road Initiative, build the infrastructure. But at what cost? The, 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 the debts that African countries have. I mean, Zambia literally just got off the hook now because of the debt they, they owe China. And the same thing, Kenya. Kenya to the airport and all that. These are the structures that were put in place by through this initiative. We don't, the opaque nature of the loans that China has given. And because of these, you find out that dictators in Africa, and it's not as if uh, the America is not also propping these dictators, because I, I think that's part of the reason. They're each fighting to see which dictator they're going to prop up. But I, I don't think it's proper for either the US or China to continue 
the kind of policies that they have with respect to whoever is there, we we'll try to see. I mean, Ethiopia is an interesting uh, paradigm you, you indicated there. But I don't see how you're going to just want to dump in money with the corruption that you know, with the system that is in place. The young people all over the place are impoverished just because of these policies. So I, I don't think it's uh, putting America... Uh, uplifting the Chinese and the Russians and saying America is that that's not a solution. It, I think it has to be otherwise. Well, Lambert, look, first of all, there's been a, a massive propaganda campaign against the Belt and Road. Uh, first of all, it is a very interesting organization called the China Africa Research Institute, John Hopkins. They have the best database in the world. There's been no project that the Chinese have seized out of the fourth. In fact, the Chinese just forgave several hundred million dollars in loans. Number two, there's no asset that's been seized. Number three is that China, the unilateral debt from African nations to China is 17% of the total debt. The debt to the bank consortiums, the Paris Club, World Bank, and IMF is over 30%, and the debt to private European bondholders is over 30%. So Africa has not driven a single country into debt, not a single country. It's China. And, I'm sorry, China has not driven a single country into debt. So, but they have built things. They have built railroads. Where, name one infrastructure project that the West has built. None. I'll give you, a, when Ch Sudan and South Sudan split in 2011. I was, uh, I, bet I was very active in Sudan. Many, many times I was there, spoke at conferences, met with the leadership, trying to convince them to go with an integrated infrastructure policy for the whole country, now North and South. So I was opposed to the separation. I didn't think it would help at all, and it hasn't. But then after we separated, I wrote an article, which I circulated with the USAID and the U.S. Agriculture Department, State Department, I said, fine, now it's separated. Go in and build the roads and use the abundance of water in South Sudan and abundance of fertile agriculture there and make it an example of a country that can develop and feed its people and progress. And they built one, one road USAID. Why would they? And in South Sudan, is a disaster beyond even what I predicted in my papers because there's no desire. There's, they don't understand. And I go back to what I wrote in my paper and I've discussed with you. They don't understand what a human being is and what a nation is. They don't care. They have no respect. When they want to get rid of a country like Bashir in Sudan, there are people, U.S. officials sneaked across the border from Chad. Total disrespect for the sovereignty of Sudan that you should get a visa. This goes on all the time. So there is no genuine concern for the development of Africa from the U.S. or Europe. China does. It may be imperfect, but China, and the U.S. has never complimented them on this. The World Bank actually has. They took six, 750 million people out of poverty. They took more people out of poverty than are in poverty in Africa now. It's about 500 million in Africa. So isn't there something they did right? Something they did right? Something we could learn from? Something we could use? And they did it through infrastructure. And that's why I know it'll work. I know it's the only thing that will work. I know that's what built the United States, the East-West Railroad, by our president who was assassinated, not only changed the United States, to connect two oceans, but it became a model for every other country in the world. That's why this the Siberian Railroad got built was a model of the U.S. Everything China is doing is a model of what Lincoln and Hamilton and others did. These are transformative. Do we want to stop millions of people of dying from poverty, hunger, cholera, respiratory diseases, or do we want to uh, hand out some plastic stores for clean water. Why not give clean water? Clean water, we know how to do it. We've done it in every single continent but Africa. Cholera is endemic in Africa. Why? Because they don't separate waste from clean water. 
which we've known for how many years? We could do it. Why don't we do it? We don't have a commitment to do it. That's interesting. And again, the, uh, one of the pushback on you, I talk about sovereignty, because if the countries are so sovereign, why do they have to depend on, on aid? They should do it by themselves. Well, so, they, should. they should. And look what's happened. When the wave of independence occurred in the 60s, in the 70s, African nations were closer to self-sufficiency than they are today. And Kwame Nkrumah wrote some fantastic articles, and they put out this book, uh, United We Fight, and he talked about the infrastructure necessary in industry and electricity and banking, and it could have been done. And then the United States and the West didn't support those concepts of development for Africa because Africa needed needs assistance. I know there's some Africans who attacked me and said, oh, we'll do it all ourselves. After 500 years of slavery, colonialism, and neocolonialism, Africa is much weaker than it should be. Its currencies are weak. So therefore, they should get assistance, not control, not taking over the sovereignty, but assistance in critical areas. Critical areas. So I would say critical area is long-term credits for infrastructure. Look, during the COVID upsurge, which is still going on, they talk about Africa. Well, if you want Africa to stop the spread of COVID, then you have to have the vaccine. Why not support vaccine medical facilities? Then if you support the facilities, you have to support the roads and distribution centers to give people the shots. There's a whole series of steps. None of that was supported. They gave millions of vaccines for free, which I appreciate, but it didn't change. Now, a couple of countries did build their own vaccination production. Uh, South Africa is one of them. But we could have trained, we could have used COVID as like a war measure. Like instead of defeating fascism, we could have defeated COVID. And again, we could have transformed the continent. Excuse me. <coughs> So these are the things that are possible. That's the, I look at every opportunity. How do we use this crisis to bring in a policy that's transformative? The a phrase that you used to, um, that the strategy of uh, the Biden administration is weaponizing democracy against China and Russia. That's pretty, that's pretty harsh. Yeah. Weaponizing. I mean, how so? Well, look, I assume you read the report. Mm -hmm. As I say, in, in major portions of the report, at least a few, they make clear that they want to stop Russia and China in Africa. But they also are not offering anything economically. And by the way, there is a report, I wrote in one of my posts on my website, that they have, in the last year, the majority of young people in Africa now favor China over the United States, which I would have thought was impossible from all my years there, because they see China doing something. Now, the United States says, no, we will give you democracy, and you will take our democracy, and you will see that our democracy and our rules-based order is good for you, and we will use it against these other powers in the world who you sh really should understand are not out to help you at all. So it becomes a weapon of geopolitics, not a real concern for dem democratic institutions or development. And again, uh, the United States refused to this day to uh, issue any kind of support for the election of uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Why is that? I find that striking. So the other thing you said is uh, democracy is an empty construct unless it emphatically includes the right and responsibility of the population to debate and to discuss what are the most appropriate ideas to guide the future of their nation. I mean, I'm from Cameroon and they have had elections repeatedly for years, but everybody has, at a certain point would give so because again, you find it impossible to bid the system in place. So democracy in that sense will not function because the people are fed up. 
they they have to go about looking for their daily bread rather than trying to work to see uh, how to change a system that has been propped up by the French with the support of uh, other Western allies. Yeah. And so, how do you how do you how do you bring democracy? I mean, uh, the, the the point you make, which is good, is I would rather support the kind of democracy that the U.S. is bringing than what the French. If they really want to, they should be talking about booting out the French from Africa, Agreed. which they find, which they find. I don't know why they find it difficult because there's nothing that France contributes to the world. You and I agree on that, right? So the the point I'm making about democracy on the continent itself is something that the, goes beyond just fighting for the future because it's now based on survival of of the present. We find it difficult even to so okay i understand your point very good very valid let's agree is democracy having elections is that democracy having elections is that democracy no. i think it's, it's part of it how do you know who to vote for if you haven't thought about it so why are we going to have an election and, and where the ideas of what is best for the country are not debated and discussed. I tr I'm talking, think about the Republic, Plato's Republic, and think about our founding fathers. And I brought up the example of these town hall meetings in Massachusetts that I, I was unaware of how prevalent they were. Bringing people together to discuss what should be done, and, and as well as for the immediate situation, or how do we solve this problem? What do we have to do? But we also have to think about where is our country going? That state of mind to have a debate and of educated citizens with the leisure time to give up a few hours every week or so often, that doesn't exist under current conditions of economic hardship. We agree. So therefore, if the United States is truly for democracy, then they're going to alleviate those conditions that prevent people from thinking and debating the future of the country. So when they go to vote every four years, they have an idea of what they want. Most people are know what they're against. And I've worked with uh, Cameroonian opposition. I worked with the um, Social Democratic Front many years ago, a good friend of mine, he passed away early. And they tried, we just tried to discuss putting forward a positive policy. And that's why I'm always very, um, suspicious of, quote, simple opposition groups. I want to see an alternative. What's your alternative? Is your alternative simply that our ethnic groups should control? Well, that's not really an alternative. And that, or is it that you know, your, your, your policy, you insist is better, but you show no proof of that? Or you just simply want to overthrow the current government? Let's just get rid of the current government. No, that is not a policy. So we have to get them. And I would like to see if we could get the leaders of Africa together to discuss ideas about the future of the continent and list the key infrastructure projects. We could maybe do all of them, but we could do key projects and then maybe go to the African Union and the African Development Bank um, run by this Nigerian and discuss maybe that there could be funding for those projects. But this, and the, I, I think the Agenda 2063 is an attempt to put those, some of those ideas out there, though it's way into the future. I mean, 2063 is two generations from now. And also the funding for it is very nebulous in the document. I read the document many years, when I was in Ethiopia, I got a copy of it. So it's not sufficient, but it does at least try to uh, orient people towards a future development. Kwame Nkrumah had some great ideas uh, for development of the continent. I consider him one of the great leaders of Africa. Other people have had uh, profound ideas. Chika Antadia, aside from being an anthropologist and Egyptologist, he was an economist. So there are, there have been ideas circulating in Africa for a long time, but they've been kept either snuffed out or, or passed over. But we can revive that. We, we need an actual renaissance of ideas for development. But the U.S., I'm telling you this, Lambert, 
The U.S. shows zero. In fact, I would call the U.S. anti-development because they don't want anything. For example, they have yet, <laughs> even after the third filling of the GERD, which occurred two weeks ago, the United States doesn't recognize the GERD as a positive policy for Ethiopia, Africa. No statement from Democrat or Republican administration, so-called Africanist, African-American, it doesn't matter. Nobody comes out publicly and supports the GERD, even though it's the biggest development sovereign project on the continent. Now, why not? Because to them, it's not important. What's more important is making sure that they can control Abi than they can actually develop Ethiopia. So, renaissance of ideas, as that's that's one thing that I take home with me. But I wanted to just get one. President Biden is bringing the heads of state from Africa in December for the yeah. summit. I hope what so. are your expectations of the summit? Not good. And not if this is the strategy it's going to be discussed. Biden, first of all, let's be honest. And I mean, we have to realize, as I said, I'm 71. I got involved in American politics when I was in high school and college. So I was 16, 17. I was already very politically active. I've watched my country for half a century. Biden is nothing new. He's been there in the Senate, vice president, now he's president. He has zero, well, I shouldn't say zero. He has next to no knowledge of Africa. Everything he says, including his statement he made last week in his so-called humanitarian, humanitarian date speech, on, on where he mentioned Tigray suffering, not Ethiopia, but only mentioned Tigray. It's given to him. Blinken or someone else writes these comments. Maybe it's Susan Rice. Maybe it's uh, Samantha Powers. He's given comments to say about Africa. He doesn't have the time, nor the inclination, nor the expansive thought process to think about Africa. So whatever is going to come out of that African summit is going to be prepared for him by so-called Africanists. I don't know who wrote the paper, but the guy that was brought in to write uh, an African policy was Judd de Vermont from CSIS, formerly CIA, formerly National Security Council. I don't know. I've, I've only talked to him a couple of times, so I don't know how much of those are his ideas or other people. But if those are the ideas that are presented to African nations and there's not a development perspective of some approximation, uh, even a faint approximation of what I'm saying, I don't think it's going to be well received, even though everyone will shake hands and get their pictures taken. So the summit, is it a, a photo op? Is it going to be a new geopolitical attack on Russia and China? Is it going to be a new plea for our rules-based order? Or will it actually be some substance that affects and changes and uplifts the suffering of the African people? That's what drives me. And if I don't see that in my president, and I don't see it in my secretary of state, and I don't see it in my congressman, then I'm not really happy with them. And I realize they're not going to do what I know needs to be done. They don't. I mean, Go ahead. It bears mentioning that the last administration had a policy that was hawkish against the Chinese and the Russians. Yeah. And I find that this is maybe a flip side of the same coin, isn't it? Because, again, it's about China and Russia. And I, I love what you said at the beginning of this conversation that what are you offering? What are you offering in the place of that? So uh, l let me flip the coin to you and ask, with the possible exception of the infrastructure, which is the one thing that you have said that, I mean, that is what would transform Africa. What else would you have loved to see in the, in the strategy? Well, I think that I, I would like to see him to uh, address specific problems uh, and offer unique kind of assistance for these problems. Like, like for example, the Sahel. The United States, for I, I think it goes back to the Obama administration, we poured in billions of dollars into military support. And of course, it's been completely a failure. And does the United States understand what would, what's necessary in the Sahel? 
Because if you want to defeat an enemy based in the desert, then you have to transform the desert. And you can transform the desert. We've done it in California. Israelis have done it in Israel. You bring water to the desert. I don't see where there's no support for a, a water program. There's no support for Transaqua. There's no support for the Grand Inca, which the big support comes from South Africa, which is an African project, which has been around for the seven, since the 70s. So that I don't see them supporting with the kinds of things that are necessary. They have these programs, the Build Back Better program two or three, and there's going to be billions of dollars and we'll figure out which country gets it. I mean, that's pathetic. Where is it going? Who's going to raise the money? Is it going to be donations? Donations are not enough. Is it going to be USAID? That's that's not going to that's not going to do it. You have to have a dedicated credit line, which is what the Chinese are doing in their own way. They're doing it. A credit line for projects that we will fund this credit for this project. You will decide. We will set up an authority, like like Roosevelt's Tennessee Valley Authority which coordinated development in the whole Appalachian middle portion of the United States. We have an authority. So much money goes into the authority. There's rules and regulations about how that money is dispersed and where it's dispersed, which is also what Jesse Jones did with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Those are things that would be helpful. Okay, we have a water problem. How do we solve it? How do we get water to where it needs to be? How do we change that? The problem, and not coming into Rwanda and saying, well, there are credible reports that you're supporting M23. You're going to have to stop that. And we also don't think that you gave uh, Rosa Benga the a fair trial uh, concerning his comments to actually support the overthrow of, of the Rwanda government, the FLN. And, uh, you know, that's going to that's gonna hurt our, our future relationship unless you know, American people, we feel very deeply about that, very deeply. And unless you address that problem, I mean, I'm not, that maybe could hurt our future relations. That's that's not a policy. And then you have Samantha Powers, who comes in and says, oh, well, these human rights violations, we, we must address these human rights violations. We really can't carry out a constructive policy unless these human rights violations you know, Ethiopia has committed major human rights violations. Well, what about the human right to live? The human right to have food? The human right to have electricity? I don't see those delineated in her human rights or these NGOs that talk endlessly about human rights. Once a child is born, that right takes over. And it doesn't in Africa. Children die for for all kinds of reasons, which all of which could be eliminated. So I, I think there has to be real honesty. And instead of this talk about, you know, we'll work with you in this general area and we'll work with you in this general area, why not lay out some specific programs that would have concrete results in improving the lives of Africans? And I must admit to you, you may not be familiar, Lambert, with this, but I almost fell over laughing when I saw the first point was Open Society, which is the name of George Soros' organization, which goes all over the world carrying out regime change and has tried in Africa as well. I mean, I think that's almost insensitive to Africans to name it Open Society. Could, couldn't be more creative. <laughs> uh, so the one thing I feel to ask you, there are many Africans who prefer to come to the U.S. than to go to China. Of course, for obvious reasons. So that's 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 saying the United States is doing something. Look, that I absolutely. You know, I love my country. I, I just wish we lived up to the principles of the founding fathers. I, I mean, people should read the Federalist Papers by Hamilton and Madison and and Jay. The founding principles of this country are, are, are unbelievable. They were revolutionary. The preamble to the Constitution. There's been no superior statement I have found in any constitution or any document that's more eloquent than the general welfare of our people and their posterity, connecting the future, the present to the future. 
So we're a great country. And when I was in Sudan during the years of heavy sanctions against Bashir and the, and the crowd there, I was somewhat surprised because everybody still wanted to go to America. Be even though the sanctions were being imposed on them, they wanted to go to America. And they asked me if I could help them. So you're absolutely right. This image of the United States is very profound and very real. And it goes back decades and decades when uh, Africans were discussing Roosevelt's meeting uh, with Churchill in 41. And we're discussing the Atlantic Charter, which was Roosevelt wanted to use against uh, the British imperialism. But there are concrete results coming from China. And there was this study done by this institute, which I have an article on. And they surveyed the young people, and they did. They said that more they consider China more favorable. Now, I don't want to go to China. I, I, I love my country, but that's not good enough. We really to live up to the aspirations of our founding fathers and and and, and people who came up with the most noble ideas. Then we should set a real example to the world. I would hope that the Democrat Party controlled government would do the right thing. I just don't see them doing it, but I, I and I've offered my help and I want them to change for the better. But right now I don't see it. And I see the same old it's obvious that the Democrats are not gonna say the same thing to the Republicans. And Biden is a completely different creature than, than Trump. But the policy doesn't advance that much new to changing, transforming Africa and improving the lives and the living standard of the African. That is in my gut. As, and if you're not addressing that problem, you're not serious. You're not sincere. You're not credible to me. So if you love the conversations and you want to read more, go to uh, Dr. Lawrence's, uh, Dr. Freeman's website. You have Lawrence Freeman, Africa and the world.com has a lot packed in there. He said five years, fascinating. And I wanted to end up on a very, maybe ask you a question that should never be asked anybody. What, I mean, the, the problem I have with the strategy is you mentioned already that it puts uh, aside the Africans. It's not at addressing the concerns, the interests of the Africans. Why, why do you think this strategy and many others don't get Africans themselves involved in finding out, okay, what is it you guys need and how do we build it? What is the problem? I mean, because we too are US citizens from Africa. So yeah. why, why, is it just that they don't consider us as being knowledgeable enough? Uh, it, it's actually a cultural problem. Uh, if you go back to John Kennedy, when he was a U.S. senator, he was advocating for African liberation, which was the only one in the U.S. Senate. When he became president, Patrice Lumumba was trying to reach him desperately because he thought he would save him after he'd been kidnapped in the Katanga province and before he was assassinated. Do you know, Lambert, who the first head of state was that came to the United States on the president? I mean, head of state, official visit. Kwame Nkrumah, March 8th, 1961. And they had a, there's a beautiful picture. I use it as much as I can on my website. The two of them smiling and laughing with each other. You know, both presidents, difference in age, of course. Kennedy was the last president following Roosevelt who had a vision for the world. With the death of Kennedy, slowly we contracted. And over a series of several decades, our school system, our cultural system, our leadership of the two parties, we have culturally, mentally shrunk as a people in the United States and as a Western world. We don't have visions anymore. The last great vision was the space exploration, which also came from Kennedy and somewhat revived under Trump and, and Biden. But we don't have a vision. So American people, they don't think about Africa. They don't care about Africa. <clears throat> and they don't know anything. I teach a class 
uh, an African, several classes. One's an introductory class. The first thing I say is, how many countries are there in Africa? <laughs> and then I say, how big is Africa? Because the map doesn't tell you how big. And people are shocked. 30, 35. I mean, they just have an idea. And this is the same problem in the Congress. There are a few congressmen who learned something about Africa. I made several trips with, as I said, African-American state legislators and ministers to Sudan to disprove slavery conception that was being put forth. So we came back, we lobbied the Congress together. And we would sit down with African-American Congress, the Black Caucus, and they wouldn't know where countries were. They would point to Ethiopia when they thought it was Sudan. The problem is our whole concern about the world and about what the world can become and how it can develop and how we can use our creativity to change and transform the world. I don't want to, I want to explore space because I think human race should move into space. I think we're long overdue to have a colony on Mars. I think that we should have nuclear fusion, not just fission, which by the way, we've actually made some progress on. I think that the human mind the Western cultural mind has been compressed, has shrunk. And therefore, we don't have a single political leader, Democrat or Republican, who has a vision about Africa, who understands Africa, who has studied Africa, who understands the aspirations of Africa. I even those people at Nkrumah. People know Lumumba because it was controversy, but they don't know what the real fight against colonialism was. So it's a, we have a, a deep cultural flaw that's getting worse. And our school system is getting worse. Education, elementary school, we're not teaching kids the basics. We're not, the population itself is, is dumber. We've dumbed down. And that's a problem that's on us, on the United States. And I'm perfectly happy to have anybody, Af American, African-American, African, Join me in coming in and creating a renaissance in the United States because we desperately need one. The renaissance of ideas, new ideas. I love that phrase, and I'm going to take that with me as uh, the bonus from this conversation. Uh, very grateful, very thankful, uh, Dr. Freeman. And uh, you and I are going to come back to talk about democracy. I think it's important to uh, get back to it. So, I, I mean, I said this is one hour we have gone above. I want to thank you for the time. Thank you for your contributions. And uh, any last word before we wrap this up? No, I, I think that I think all thoughtful, moral uh, people in the United States should begin to be concerned, if they haven't already, about the conditions of life in Africa and should devote at least some portion of their time to, to formulating policy to eliminate poverty and hunger and bring back a dignified, productive, meaningful life for a continent that's going to have two and a half billion people. And if we don't do that, Boko Haram is going to be a minor problem if you have a billion youth with no jobs. So this is necessity, but it's also morally the right thing to do. Thank you very much. And if you missed the conversation, it's going to be up on our site very soon, a few minutes after the broadcast. You can watch it on Facebook, you can watch it on LinkedIn, and you can sign up on our YouTube channel, The Lambom Show. We're here every Wednesday, and we're talking about Afri U.S. Africa policy, currently looking at the new strategy. Again, next Wednesday is another time. We'll bring up another panelist. If not, I'll call up Dr. Freeman to have another conversation. If you send, you. Please send me a link. I'll circulate it. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Shukran. Thank you.